chapter um, 13. Um, I summarized it for you like I've done, oops. Um, chapter, I, like I said, we went, these will be the three chapters they're going to be doing. I summarized it, guys, with, um, with a couple of things. So if you guys go there, the first and the most important thing, this is industrial lumineers. talks about industrial lumineers um, in terms of special consideration and characteristics of industrial lumineers. Um, a couple of considerations when you buy industrial or commercial, it really doesn't have to be industrial, lumineers, you have to pay attention to the dollar value, Karen, because ultimately we work for, uh, uh, when you guys become a designers, um, you can design the best system that you can. If it's not affordable, nobody will nobody will install it, right? Uh, you're gonna you're gonna see this one all the time, um, Adam. That you cannot that you can design the best system. If it's too expensive, nobody's gonna install it. So, a couple of things. When we buy uh, lighting for industrial or commercial guys, the most important thing, or one of the most important thing, is cost. Cost is divided into three major parts. You guys know that. Common sense. Cost is initial cost, how much is going to cost you to buy these LEDs, $200 a pop, right? That's your initial cost. The second, so you have to keep this into consideration. The second cost that you have to do is maintenance cost. How long will it take you to maintain these fixtures? Are they easy, maintainable? Are they high uh, maintenance? You need to spend a lot of time, your, your personnel have to spend a lot of time cleaning them, changing the ballast or the drivers into them. Uh, cleaning the louvers, uh, fixing them when they when they break and what's not. So maintaining the fixture is as important as the cost of maintaining them is as important as the cost of um, of operating them. Uh, and and, 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 um, and initial cost. And the most important one, guys, is the operating cost. Uh, that's why we get into the energy code. The most one of the probably one of the most important thing right now is how do you reduce the operating cost of your fixtures? So between the initial cost, the maintenance cost, and the operating cost, taking all these into consideration, Karen, it will give you something called the NPV, which is net present value. Net present value will decide that this fixture, based on the initial cost of $200, based on an annual maintenance cost of $50, and based on operating cost of $150, um, this will be a good or not so good option for my plan. Does that make sense, guys? When you decide on the type of the fixture, you have to take into consideration the initial cost, maintenance cost, operating cost. The energy code, guys, will require you to cut down on your operating cost, which is the kilowatt hours, in order to meet the energy code, um, as well as um, it, it's claimed, guys, like 35% of your operating cost electrically is coming out of your light. So if you can reduce these by half or two thirds, you can save a lot of money. Can I have thumbs up, Chad, that we fully understand when we pick a picture, we have to take initial cost and in, in consideration, maintenance cost and operating cost. Adam, cool. Derek, Karen. So these are the three costs that you have to take into consideration. The most important one, obviously, the operating cost. You can have a very cheap fixture like incandescent guys that's going to cost you a lot of money to operate or operate over uh, the life of that fixture. So when you put all these together, it comes up with a value. When you put all these together right now, guys, in a commercial building, it will get you fluorescent fixtures are the most efficient in terms of cost, initial maintenance and operating. And LEDs, um, are, are when you take all these into consideration, LEDs and, and uh, fluorescent fixtures are the most common. Okay, so that's the cost. The second thing that you have to take into consideration when you talk about fixtures, my friends, is... Um, are the fixtures in a, in a in this industrial plant or commercial plant, are they in a damp location or wet location? Damp location, wet location, guys, uh, they will be more expensive. If you put a fixture in the parking lot here when it's snowing right now in Minnesota, um, you're going to obviously pay more than if you put the fixture right in this room, which is dry. Okay, so that's another consideration. Obviously, if, you, if it's in a wet location or damp location, you have to take into consideration that the fixture will be more expensive and it has to be rated for these locations. The third thing that you guys have to take into consideration um, um, is, is hazardous location. Uh, Karen, in the industrial project in the spring, I will go over hazardous location in details, guys. Class one, class two, and class three. I know you guys, the ones who came from the electrical program, you should have gone through this. So that will go over again. Um, so hazardous location, class one, flammable gases. Um, class two, 
combustible fiber, combustible uh, fibers, and ignitable uh, combustible dust and ignitable fibers is class three. If you have a fixture, guys, in class one, class two, or class three, these fixtures have to be rated for these hazardous classified locations. For example, you put a fixture in a gas station in a class one, div one, or div two location. It has to be rated for explosion proof. Done. Uh, and you know what, the, uh, Derek, what that will run you? If you put that fixture right above your head in a class one, div one location, it will run you three to four times more expensive because it has to be rated for class one, div one location. Okay. So you have the class one, flammable gases, class two, combustible dust, class three, ignitable fibers. Division one, guys, the hazard exists at all times. Division two, the hazard exists an, uh, under uh, abnormal condition or in the case of a class three, um, the place where we store, store the combustible fibers. Um, so what's in it for you guys? When you install a fixture in a classified location, make sure the fixture is rated for these classified locations. That's all what I want to say about the fixtures. There's also groups that goes with the, with the class one and class two guys, group A through group G, I believe. Um, so not only the fixture have to be rated for a class one div one, but also has to be for rated for class uh, group A through A B C uh, D, I believe group A through D um, or A through G, depending upon if it's class one or class two. So there's a group of gases. They group the gases, guys, and the dust in groups um, of uh, flammability and what's not and danger. Um, so when you say group A, class one, div one, the fixture have to be rated for group A, uh, class one, div one, group A. Any comments, guys, any questions? We will go through the groups, Karen, in details in the industrial project. For the time being, if you put a fixture in a hazardous location, make sure it's rated for this hazardous location. Cooper, guys, uh, makes a lot of... Um, uh fixtures that rated for hazardous location you can see on the fixture it says class one div one class two div one and two class three div one and and two so one fixture can be in all these classified locations any comments guys about the hazardous location for fixtures cool everybody got the hazardous location for fixtures hazardous location so we have group a group b group c group d locations um in terms of of uh, of hazard okay so that's basically the hazardous location i want to talk about a uh, floodlight when you put a floodlight these are your typically outside light guys um you have to take into consideration a couple of rules uh when you put a floodlight outside uh for the height you have to coordinate guys with um with the federal communication commission fcc and federal aviation um, Admin Federal Aviation Administration (FAA). So when you guys put these big towers that has light outside, if you are, I don't think you will be probably involved in these. There is some coordination with FAA and FCC. So be careful what type of fixture you put because you will interfere with the telecommunication. You could interfere with the airplane moving around, uh, or um, you could also interfere with the telecommunication. So there is coordination. That's when you get into a 200. 150 towers or, or 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 higher if you are below 50 50 guys you don't have any problem for the most part unless you're close to the airport um typically you don't have a whole lot of problems so be aware guys so we have for example up to 150 feet you have to have two steady burning red obstacles light at the top of the of the obstruction um, uh, at the top of the uh, of, of the obstruction or the construction. So the tower, if your fixture is up to 150, you have to have light to warn the pilots that there is a tower there, don't hit them. Um, if between 150 to 300, you have to have uh, one flashing red 300 um, beacon. You can see them on these telecommunication tower when you're driving, Derek. Do you see these flashing lights? So they want to they want to alert the um, people who are ri riding choppers and and little airplanes that there is a tower. Don't go ahead and hit it. Do you guys make sense? Especially choppers when they're moving around, uh, police choppers or traffic choppers or what's not. Um, if you if you go to two two hundred two thousand feet, now that's a that's a big tower. Um, they have other requirements. One red um, uh, beacon at the top and then plus flashing grid beacons and steady burning grid beacons at different alternatives like approximately every 100, 150 feet. So long story short, 
I don't emphasize these enough uh, a lot because we, we typically we you don't end up doing it. But if you were to do towers, um, you know, 150, 100 feet or more, you have to pay attention to the um, um, FAA and FCC requirements. Any comments, guys? We know that we have to pay attention to the requirement of warning the pilots from these big tall tower. Most of what we do, Derek, is we're looking at 30, 40 foot lighting fixture outside. We don't have to worry too much about it unless you're closer to the airport. Um, so that for the most part, you don't have to worry about these. Okay. So that's basically um, um, the, in terms of the towers, floodlight outside. There's a table, guys, in page 111, talks about the NEMA type beam spread. These are for the floodlights. So if you have NEMA 1, it gives you 10 to 18 degrees spread. Uh, NEMA 7 gives you 130 and larger spread angles as how much you want to spread these beams as you flood this light into the desired location. Um, okay, so that's basically it in terms of FAA, FCC, and the rules. Emergency lights. For emergency light, guys, you, you have done it with me. You have to have an emergency light. Um, to lit the egress path, and we have to maintain an average of one foot candle. You have done that one with me, and you put your lights. The most important thing to remember is one foot candle maintained average uh, for EDs uh, emergency light. Um, typically, and if you have a bug eyes, they have to have uh, by code. They have to be there for 90 minutes, um, and they have to maintain a voltage up to 87.5 percent of their rated voltage up to 90 minutes. Um, so that's basically it, maintaining one foot candle. So that's that's all what I have, guys, about this particular chapter. Any comments, any questions? So please pay attention to the cost, the initial cost, the operating cost, the maintenance cost. Uh, all together, make something called NPV. That's the value that decided if the fixture is good. The amber wet location fixture have to be rated for that. Hazardous location fixture have to be rated for that. Um, floodlights, if you have a floodlights on towers, outdoor, of course, you have to pay attention to the FAA and FCC rules. And if you have an emergency light, make sure you maintain a one foot candle average for the egress path. And don't forget the exit signs on all the exit, uh, the egress path exits in the building, typically for, 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 for typically from every side of the building decided by the architects. Any comments, guys, any question? Can I have a thumbs up chat? Easy, simple, right? Okay, so I don't know if you guys, when when IES uh, uh, ladies were here yesterday, there is, if you go to the IES documents that talk, talk about lighting, there's a lot of detailed information. You can you can uh, make a Bachelor of Science in, in lighting. So keep in mind, you are learning lighting as a designer. In the future, Derek, you can branch if that's what you like, and you become an expert, and you come and teach me. Make sure you come back, so, okay? We give you guys enough information just to be basically dangerous. Do so you can branch and, and and go in any direction you want. Okay. The second thing I want to go over, guys, is um, cost of light. Number 14. We were just talking about cost of light. It talks about the cost of light initial and during operation. This chapter, now we decided the type of fixture that we need to do. Now we need to use the net um, um, net present value. NPV, net present value, to decide what type of fixture is um, is good for us. When you talk about cost of light in Chapter 14, guys, I was just mentioning a second ago, and um, the first cost is going to be the initial cost. Here's what they claim, the smarter than Chad. Uh, the, this one from your overall cost of the fixture, guys, your initial cost is 5 to 10%. So look at how small that is, the initial cost. The operating cost is 40 to 50% of the cost of a fixture is operating it, the kilowatt hour that you're gonna burn it at. Uh, maintenance cost is gonna be 30 to 40%, give or take. So long story short, Adam, between the maintenance cost and the operating cost of the fixture, you're looking at 80 to 90% of the overall cost of your fixture. So for example, if the cost of the fixture guys is hundred dollars, Operating, initial, and maintenance, okay, over the life of that fixture annually. Say annually, um, only probably 10 to $20 will be the initial cost to buy that fixture. The 80%, 80 cents on every dollar would be out of a dollar. 80 cents will be to operate and maintain that fixture. 
and most of the 80 cents actually probably 60 cents or 50 cents to operate the fixture can you guys see why the energy code is pushing everybody for leds because operating them is cheaper uh, like we heard about leds yesterday from ies says that their problem is what they're burning now that the maintenance costs become high <laughs> So do you, see, do you guys see what they were saying yesterday about the airport? When they put them there, they burn. Now you have to go change them. That's 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 a, that's maintenance cost. So you have to kind of balance between the maintenance cost and operating cost. But typically, operating cost is at least 50 60 percent of the cost of the fixture. So well, that's why we're pushing in commercial industrial building as they push a lot of indoor, a lot of uh, fluorescent lights to meet the energy code and LEDs in this day and age. And if you're outdoor, you're using a high pressure sodium, right? Outdoor um, or uh, metal halides or LEDs. Any comments, guys, any questions about the cost of light, the three factors that we just talked about and the percentages? The percentages so if i am to summarize something karen i would say the operating cost is the big chunk of the cost 50 to 60 percent maintenance is a big deal too because you put a fixture in a place and you have to change it every six months you have to send the personnel pay them 25 dollars an hour plus benefits right if they are qualified maintenance electrician or uh, um or, or journeyman's right to go change these fixtures because you have to have licensed people doing this work, right? You can't send Adam to go change a lighting fixture unless he's supervised by a licensed electrician. These are electrical work. Any comments, guys? Any questions about the cost? Initial operating and maintenance. So that's that's the most important thing. Initial operating and maintenance. Maintaining. So when you maintain the fixture to reduce the maintenance cost, um, Derek, when you put the fixture, if the fixture are in a, in a very high ceiling, 40 foot ceiling make sure you put a fixture that that doesn't burn more often because you every time you have to have a crane to go pull, pull you all the way up so if you have an led that burns every um you know every year you have or every six months you have to go change it that will increase your operating cost so you have can you guys see where the operating cost becomes a big deal um try to put your fixtures at a place where it's easier to maintain 10 to if you can of course 10 to 12 foot is ideal where you can uh, on a ladder you can reach it you go higher than 12 feet it becomes you have a longer ladders and lifts and what's not so um as you put your fixture and you design your system make take this into consideration um operating cost reduction so initial cost how do you reduce the initial cost guys you negotiate with davis and associates on the price of the fixture they're going to buy that's the only way you can do it right initial cost maintenance costs how do you reduce your maintenance costs by placing your fixture in a place where it's easier to maintain them you don't need a lift every time to go change these fixtures if you can or by installing fixtures that um that does not burn more often you know um leds i hate to say leds but now their their drivers fail too um fluorescent for example you put them in a place and uh, they're for the most part they're good with give you good maintenance so that's the maintenance and the initial cost. The operating cost, how do you maintain, have reduce your operating cost? Here's the option number one, here, and you have electronic ballast, more efficient electronic ballast. You guys learned that one with your friend Chad. High efficiency uh, fixture and lamps. Buy high efficiency fixture and lamps, give you more light per what, per what more luminous per what. Ballast is efficient. And to reduce the, the cost, and and to meet the energy code ASHRAE 90.1 2012 or 2004 like we do in minnesota to reduce that one guys you have to have an occupancy sensor like you guys did with your friend chat occupancy sensor low voltage switching dimming daylight harvesting these are methods to reduce your uh, lion's share of the cost of the uh, the fixtures um fixture installation and operation and maintenance which is the operating of that fixture any comments my friends any questions so summarize when you guys do the cost of your fixture is made out of initial cost operating cost and maintenance cost operating cost is typically 50 to 60 percent of your cost is operating you can reduce the initial cost by negotiating when you buy these fixture with the uh, from the uh, vendors maintenance cost you can reduce this one by having uh, the least maintenance fixture installed in the most awkward location that need height or you need to climb over things and what's not mount your fixture in a location where you can maintain them with ladders instead of lifts if you can 
But the big chunk of reduction of the cost of the fixture happened with the operating, and you can reduce that one by having electronic ballast, efficient electronic ballast, high efficiency fixtures and lamps, lighting control, you add a lighting control, low voltage light control, occupancy sensor, low voltage switching, dimming, daylight harvesting, all these methods, guys, will reduce your consumption of power, which will reduce the operating cost of your fixture, which make you uh, make your lighting system efficient. Any comments, guys, any questions? And then you, if you go in that route, um, uh, um, Derek, you will be like Lisa specialized, and then you go take it to the next level. <laughs> Any comments, guys, any questions? With your friend Chad, your jack of all trades. Tomorrow we're going to do a short circuit analysis and an art clash. So you're jumping from one software to another. So we'll give you guys the flavor of all these and hopefully we'll give you a career in one of them. The last thing I want to talk about, guys, after you do all this class is retrofit. Um, almost every, when you go to Devs and Associate, they'll tell you guys almost every couple of years, like, Three to three to five years, the industry changes and they go and retrofit all the lighting systems. They have uh, more efficient ballasts, more efficient lights. So they used to have 40 watt fluorescent lights. Now they're moving to 32 watt for the same amount of light. Uh, they're moving, I think, 20, 25 or something like this, trying to reduce this one from 32 to 25 or something similar to that. So because of all this care, and there's something called retrofit, they walk into a building like this, take all these old non-efficient um, lamps and ballast, and they have a retrofit kit. They got, got out all these fixtures, take the gut out, and they put new gut into that fixture to make it more efficient. That's the retrofit. So if you have a fixture that running, uh, for example, fluorescent fixture of 40 watt, a good uh, reduction on that one, is to go reduce it into uh, with a electronic with a electromagnetic ballast reduce changing them to electronic ballast with a 32 watt fluorescent fixtures or leds with a driver leds with a driver so anyway in page 115 guys have a couple of uh, recommendation how to make your energy efficient for the most part guys um they're using uh um, T5, T8, fixtures T5, T8 instead of T12, uh, watts 32 instead of 40 watts uh, for fluorescent, or LEDs that can get you a fraction of the, the, the power that needed to burn uh, the fluorescent lights. So a lot of people will hire you like the airport or, uh, I don't know, University of Minnesota or what's not, hire engineering firms, guys, to do study on their lighting system to retrofit it with most if it, the most efficient lighting system um, to date, to date. Okay, any comments, guys, any questions? You can also keep in mind, guys, uh, remember that dirt depreciation factor. You can make your fixture efficient, Karen, by uh, having your personnel go and clean your fixture. Look at the lenses and the louvers. If you have an annual maintenance where they can take those lenses, clean them, they become more efficient, they give you more light. Um, so, any comments, guys, any questions about the cost of lighting? Is that enough, guys, to give you guys flavor what cost of lighting is all about? Any type of lighting. All right, so that's all we have for cost of lighting, my friends. The last thing I want to talk about is a very specialty, guys. Karen, probably that applies to you on the theater and what's not. This is not theater, so to say. It's called display light. When your friend Chad is singing his favorite song, you guys want to listen to it? Oops. So when Chad is singing his favorite song and you and the light is chasing you on the theater, right? You guys see that light, spotlight light chasing you. Karen probably know more than I do about this. In order, now these are specialty light, display light, they call them. You can display produce, you can display products, you can display people as they, um, as they sing or as they present certain things. In order to make things stand out, uh, Derek, you have to throw 300 to 500 more light on the object that you display compared to the surrounding. Does that make sense? Do you guys see that spotlight when people are singing? The light is chasing them, right? And everything's dark around them. That's what a spotlight is. You shoot the light right at the object uh, or, the, or the person that you're trying to, um, to make it stand up. So, the recommendation, 300 to 500 uh, more light than the surrounding. 
um, typically we're talking here not about theater in particular, guys. We're talking about um, the products. You know, when you go buy your favorite lettuce, do you eat lettuce, guys? No? Tomatoes and what's not, you want to make them look so fresh and nice. You have light shining on them, um, some water on them, make them look, look nice for people to buy them, right? Your favorite sweater, uh, you have to have light shining on them, give it the real color of that, uh, uh, Chad's green favorite color. Um, so this is what type of light that we're, we're looking at, the display light. Um, now, display light guys, for the most part, are exempt from the code because these are meant to uh, move the U.S. economy, right? Make you spend more money. And if it moves the economy, we don't want to hold it. So, okay, so keep in mind the display. They use L low voltage incandescent light for this, believe it or not, like 24 volt incandescent light as a display light um, with different watts. They also use metal halide. Um, they use them in lattice and what's not. They put metal halide shining in certain certain uh, objects. And LEDs now, they use also LEDs. All these guys are uh, to get you to, to the product that you need to buy to stand out, to make the product that you need to buy stand out. Any comments, guys, any questions about the display? LEDs, low voltage, incandescent, or metal halide, typically they are exempt from the code, typically, when you display them. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you don't pay attention to the uh, to how efficient the, the, the light is, but um, you want to you make them efficient, and you want to display the product in the proper way so you can sell your produce. So that's basically it. There's something called fading, uh, color fading, guys. Um, the fixture, if you have uh, display light shining at objects, it will... Um, it will affect the color of these objects over time, so you have to pay attention to that one. If the if you keep shining that rays on the object, it could fade. The color of the object will fade. So there's a, a few attention to um, the the color fading of these objects that you try to display. <clears throat> um, so the UV and the um, ultraviolet and infrared. A degrade valuable art objects so they can these if you shine them on object they will degrade them so if you're if you're shining up uh, you know arts so you might have to consult with you know specialists who can have the proper type of light to shine on on that uh, beautiful art if you are if you're displaying uh, cucumbers and lettuce not a big deal right compared to the Mona Lisa or one of these uh, high profile arts Okay, the last thing I want to talk about this one, guys, please, in page, if you go to page 118, um, 118, Adam, if you guys go to page 118, please, 118, guys, it gives you different type of fixtures with a beam spread, that's how they do them, if you look at the first one, there's a lamp, it has rated um, life 200, um, tung uh, halogen, uh, tungsten halogen, it has a beam of 28 by 28. So Karen is, here's the angle, 28 by 28 is the angle that you're trying to display. You shoot the light this way, you're beaming up. And it gives you guys a display, zero AM angle, and gives you the distance from the object. If you put it at four feet from the object, then the initial uh, foot candle at the beam can give me 113 foot candle. Uh, beam length can be three, beam width can be three, and the maximum space for every illuminance is three. So if you guys look at this table, it will give you, how do you place these? Right, Derek, how do you place them? I mean, we know how to place fixtures in a room like this. We use visual, how do you place them? These are recommendations based on the lumens and the type of the fixture that manufacturers say, if you are to use this one, place them every three feet uh, on center and three feet away from the object. You can see that at a beam of uh, 28 by 28. It gives you a beam of 28 by 28. So anything, Above 28 in every direction, it would not be lit, right? So can you see focus it on it and place them? How, how far you place them? Uh, if distance in between them and the beam, that, because they're dis they, they display, they're beaming or focus um, at certain areas. So anyway, so these are the MR16 and what's not. There's a lot of, I know some of these information is dated, guys. But if you are to work on the display, so pay, pay attention to a schedule like the one that you're looking at that will get you the layout of these fixtures. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand that. For display, they will have a table like this that will tell you how far, what's the distance between them, what's the beam, 
Um, and of course, what type of fixture you're using? Um, you can use uh, low voltage incandescent. You can use LEDs. A lot of them, metal halides, and what's not. Any comments? Any questions, guys, about the spotlight or display light for produce or objects? Any comments? Any questions? So with this, if you guys don't have any comments or questions, that will uh, cap basically our lighting class. So we spend uh, 16 chapters talking about lighting. Um, we give you guys a flavor of lighting uh, to take it to the next level. Believe me, this is just touching 10% of what lighting is all about. The higher, the 90% that's left when you guys graduate from here, you run with it and you become IES uh, 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 lighting um, certified lighting designer, and you take it to the next level with all the classes that you can take. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, questions? Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay. That's all what I have for you. Um...